for science! Hey, what's up guys? Today we're going to make a short video about playing from behind and playing to win. Uh, a lot of times you're going to find yourself in Hearthstone games that are, uh, they, they look bad, for lack of a better term. It looks like a definite loss. So we're going to talk about uh, why you should continue to play your best and how you can kind of think about those games. And I'll give you an example later. I'll show you a game where it very much looked like I was going to lose. First, let's go ahead and define tempo. So tempo is initiative or momentum, basically being the person who's in control of making the trades, deciding where the attacks are going. That's the person who has initiative, tempo, momentum. Uh, a lot of times value and tempo are considered to be kind of opposites, but there are shades of gray in between. Uh, I'll talk about like a common tempo example for a card is a card like Sap. So Sap doesn't actually kill an opponent's minion, but it removes it from the board, puts it back into their hand for a very cheap amount of mana. And that allows you to then develop your own board with the rest of your mana that turn, thus getting back initiative, gaining tempo. So tempo is really how far ahead you are on the board. Uh, how much mana you spent to do certain things can also be considered tempo. Value cards are more things like flame strike. I use one card to kill a lot of cards, but I spent a lot of my mana to do so, meaning I don't also have the ability to develop a lot of things onto the board. Generally, the opponent gains the tempo back the next turn, and I'm forced again to deal with it. So that's kind of the difference between tempo and value. Playing from behind is generally considered playing from behind in tempo. Some decks are not really equipped to overcome a severe tempo disadvantage. And oftentimes you'll see these decks are labeled as tempo. So think of like Tempo Mage, Tempo Warrior. Uh, a good example is Tempo Warrior doesn't run Brawl, right? And uh, oftentimes they don't run Brawl. Now Brawl is a great card for gaining the board back or coming from behind. But the problem with Brawl and the reason why you don't often see it in a Tempo Warrior deck is it's a terrible card when you're ahead. You definitely don't want to Brawl when you have four minions on the board and they have two. That's just not a good play. And because the rest of the deck is designed to have such a Tempo advantage, you really don't want to be running a Brawl in your Tempo Warrior deck. Here's some decks that are kind of designed to play from behind. Control Warrior, Freeze Mage, Control Priest. These are generally reactive decks that are designed to play from behind. When you play these decks, you actually need to be comfortable playing from behind. If you're not, it's going to be a struggle for you. Now, oftentimes when you're playing decks like this, it may look like you're going to lose. But it's important that if you decide that you're going to play one of these styles of decks, that, and, and if you are trying to push for some sort of ladder goal, whether that be Legend or Rank 5 or whatever that might be, that you play the games out, you attempt to continue to make the correct play every turn, and uh, you'll find that a certain percentage of the time you're going to win games that look like sure losses. And winning an extra five games or so over the course of 100 games that looked like you were supposed to win them, even if your percentage chance to win them was 20%, 25%, it's still worth it because that's going to be uh, the difference of five stars over the course. And, you know, net, every time you win instead of lose a game, that's a net gain of like two stars, really, right? So uh, you're going to find yourself finishing higher on the ladder as long as you can continue to make the correct decision every single turn. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a game from yesterday's stream. If you pause the game at multiple spots along the way and asked whether it looked like I was going to lose or win, you probably thought I was going to lose. I played it out and I tried to make the correct decision every turn. A little bit of luck, possibly some misplays from my opponent and continue to make those tough decisions and we are able to go ahead and eke out a win. So let's go ahead and take a look at that game right now. All right, so the game starts off and it's warrior versus warrior. We got ourselves a mirror match. Now it's not clear what type of warrior you're facing these days in the meta. There's about four viable versions that you're going to run into on the ladder. So we basically need to determine at first what we're playing, but we can't do that before the mulligan. So we're going to mulligan trying to find things like Fiery War Axe because those are the tools we always want. What we think we're going to look at, look for early on in the game is whether it's an aggro warrior, a tempo warrior, or another control warrior, which means it's a mirror matchup. We have no play here on turn two, so it's armor up. Here's where we start to pay close attention. So he plays Fiery War Axe, but doesn't really tell us anything. But he doesn't hit our face, so now we're thinking Tempo Warrior, Control Warrior. Now playing any of these minions into this Fiery War Axe is just a net loss for us, so since we're a value deck, we're not going to do that. 
And here he plays the Frothing Berserker. Now here's where he gains the tempo. And for the rest of the game, we are going to struggle to gain it back. So we go ahead and drop the 3-5. It is the best minion we have that can fight back on the board. So we go ahead and just play that out. He's able to protect the Frothing Berserker with a Blood Hoof Brave. And now it's going to be a struggle because we don't have any tools like Bash or Execute to go ahead and get rid of either of these minions. So we're going to go ahead and play Harrison and just draw into our deck. We do find a Bash. That's actually a pretty big deal. And here he makes a very aggressive play. This isn't necessarily a tempo play, but I think at this point he feels like he has the advantage. So, you know, while it does clear our board, this is a play that I believe is mostly about drawing. So he gets value out of this battle rage, as well as putting pressure on our face in the form of a 7-3 Frothing Berserker. Now here he actually misses out on 5 damage. Uh, it turned out that it didn't really matter because we were still going to trade in as far as he was concerned, or as far as we were concerned, we were going to do this anyway, but he didn't know he could have gotten 5 extra damage in. And actually that does come back at some point later in the game to matter, so... If he'd have played, if he went the aggressive route and then continued that aggressive stance and gone ahead and attacked straight into our face there with the 5-5, five five, he might have been able to close this game out. He coins out Malkarok here getting a Poison Blade. That looks pretty bad for us right now, and we don't have a clear way to deal with it yet, so what we try to do is go a little bit wide here, playing two minions, rather than just shield, blo shield blocking and hoping to come up with some removal. So we play a couple minions trying to get a little bit of value. He actually makes a very strange play here, and I can't really find a way to agree with this play. I get what he's going for. He's trying to give his Frothing Berserker the most amount of attack he can, thus putting the highest amount of pressure on us, right? That's really what his, his play is here. But he ends up giving us full value on this Acolyte of Pain. We draw three cards off of this thing. And that allows us to dig deeper into our deck and as a control warrior, find more answers uh, for the questions that he's, he's posing to us. So we end up drawing into the map for the Golden Monkey. That's not going to do us any good right now. What we need to find is something like a Shield Slam, and lo and behold, there it is right off the top. So we know now we're going to execute and Shield Slam. And now it's just a matter of figuring out what to do with the rest of our mana. And at this point, I think we're still on the draw into our deck plan. So we want to play this Acolyte of Pain. So it's going to be a Shield Slam and an Execute, and then drop that Acolyte of Pain, and hope that we can draw into f further answers. Because right now we're still missing a few very important things. We know that some things are coming, right? We know that a Temple Warrior is going to play threats like Ragnaros, uh, Cairn, Sylvanas, Varian Rin. We know that these types of threats are coming, so we need things like Big Game Hunter, Brawl, and other shield slams and executes and things like that that are going to allow us to deal with those threats as they come. So again, we end up getting two cards off of this Acolyte because he really wants to apply pressure to our face. And at this point, I understand. That is the correct way for him to play this out now. He's already given us three cards off of the last Acolyte. So at this point, giving us two more cards off of this Acolyte isn't the worst thing he could do. He really wants to get that eight damage in on our face. Now, we don't have an Execute. We don't want to use the second slam if we don't have to. However, we still don't got, get one, so we map the Golden Monkey. We still don't get one, so now we really do want to just throw this slam out there. And huzzah, off the top, there's the Execute. So now we can go ahead and throw that out and click the Armor Up button. We're still not at a fairly good life total right now. 16 health. We don't have the board. We've never had the board in this game. He is going to continue to put pressure on us. And here's Sylvanas. He top decks Sylvanas, plays Sylvanas out, goes ahead and armors up. And this is another, I mean, Sylvanas isn't the biggest threat when it's an empty board, but it's a clock. It's five damage a turn. It, it has to be dealt with. So we go ahead and we play the shield block and we get the Gore Howl at the top. Now, Gore Howl is a very key card for control warriors. It allows you to potentially five for one. You don't often end up getting full seven for one for obvious reasons, but, you know, it's it's a super value card. You clear a lot of minions. Now, we don't have a lot of life to work with, but still, it's a card that's going to allow us to get attacks in and maintain somewhat of a board control state. He plays the Varian. We do now have the Brawl, so we're going to go ahead and be able to play that. And actually, there's two really good outcomes here. If Varian wins, we can big game Hunter it now that Ragnaros is out of the way. And if Kit Kats didn't lie, and he didn't, 
Armorsmith always wins the brawl, so we're able to go ahead and just take one damage here. And instead of armoring up, we're going to play a taunt. Um, Bloodhoof Brave here. We only have two of these left, and we don't run the monkey uh, in our deck outside of the golden monkey. So these are our last two taunts here. He uses one execute on the first one. And plays another Corcoran Elite, allowing him to push four more damage into our face. Getting us to the very unhealthy total of four. However, because we're below 12, our revenge is now activated. We can clear this board with a simple revenge, allowing us to armor up and play our second taunt. So at this point, while we are super low, and it does look like the game is very close to being over, and we, we can lose at any moment, we do feel a little bit like we may have stabilized. And then this turn happens. Ravaging Ghoul, execute our last taunt, a wrathy weaponsmith arming himself with a 2-2 weapon. So this is the turn where it really feels like we just have no chance. We've been playing from behind the entire time. But now, you know, the card we've almost drawn through our entire decks, both of us. So there's really no option here except to hit one of these 3-3s three with our weapon, going down to one health, armoring up and playing our own Gromish to kill the other 3-3. Three three. Now this is what I'm talking about. You have to make these kind of fearless plays. There's really no other play. So it's not necessarily that it's fearless. But you just have to deal with these types of situations and just do them. It's not like it's... It's not like this is some sort of amazing play I made here. This is the only play, really. I talked through my one other option, which involves me using a shield slam, but it's just really not a feasible option here. It's much better to play the Gromish. It also puts a threat on the board in my favor, allowing me to potentially... Because I'm going to have to find a way to win the game, right? So allowing me to get a clock back on him. But now we're dead to any Gromish top deck. So what we've done here is, while likely we're still going to lose this game from this moment, we have now put ourselves in a position to win the game. And that is all you can really do in moments like these. So he hits us back down to one again, and he plays his Fierce Monkey. Fierce Monkey's not a problem. We can just hit it with the Gromish, and that'll allow us to armor up and play the Sylvanas. Now at this point, are we ever going to hit another minion with our weapon? No. We're not going to ever hit another minion with our weapon. We're at three health. We are never going to be higher than that if we continue to use our weapon as removal. So it's time to go ahead and hit his face. Try to set ourselves up for some sort of clock that will allow us to finish the game off if we get lucky. So here's again what I'm talking about. We All we can do is give ourselves the best possible chance at this moment. We still have to get lucky. He still has to not draw Gromish. And that's actually a big deal. Although now we can actually kill his second armor smith. Go up to five life, meaning we are no longer dead to Gromish. So at this point, you feel a little bit better, and now it starts to feel like this is a game we can actually win. Now, there is an argument to be made there. I should have just dropped the uh, the big game hunter, but I couldn't, if, if, you, if you see. There's a reason why I couldn't. You can't drop big game hunter without big game huntering something, so I would have to kill my own Gromish. So just a little explanation for you guys there. And he finally gets the Gromish, and we win the game. We have exact lethal on board, and he chooses death, and there you go. So, this is one of those games, you can see the relief on my face, playing from behind the entire time, but we were able to pull out the win. Basically, just get a little lucky, a couple of small potential misplays from our opponent, and just making the plays that we had to make when we had to make them, and not just giving in. So, thank you guys very much. If you want to follow the stream, twitch.tv slash willydillssf. I love you guys, and I'll see you soon. Stay.